Welcome to episode two of the Royal Flush Podcast. On this episode, we talk to Ryan Resendiz. Ryan has an amazing family story. He's a local boy. He grew up in East Providence, Rhode Island, has now created an entrepreneurship for himself in the restaurant business, but we talk way more than just food and drink. Ryan has a great story of family, life, wisdom, some great aspects that Ryan has touched on. I think you're really going to enjoy the episode. Check it out, Royal Flush episode two. Thanks for watching. Nice setup. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. We put it together in like a day. Yeah. We had talked about doing it probably around Christmas, and we just just dragged our feet about it for no real reason. And then we're like, you know what? Let's let's finally do it. And we painted the wall black, put these up, had Jim make the sign, and in twenty four. Well, it's hours. not like you guys don't have anything else to do. Well, yeah, yeah. We've been. I mean, like what do you do? Here. Yeah, exactly. I'm just sitting there all day doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like Mark's out there in the streets working. Yeah. Right? And you're just like, nah, I'm going to do a podcast. Yeah, <laughs> playing around on the computer, looking at pictures. Doing Kyle doing, doing graphic design. design. Okay. We're good to go. Okay. Ryan, tell me about your background as a kid. Where'd you grow up? Tell me about your family. Start from there. So uh, I grew up in East Providence, and uh, my parents came here from the Azores in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had my sister in 77, me in 81, my brother in 86, and... You know, grew up in East Providence like a really kid, you know, uh, big, big family. Parents, my mom had uh, 10 brothers and sisters, a lot of cousins, you know, so mm -hmm. there wasn't uh, a lot of room for friends. It was just because you're always around family, you know? Yep. So, you know, sixth grade, we moved to Seekonk, graduated from Seekonk High School. So I did, you know, middle school and high school in Seekonk. And, you know, after college, I went where I, where I uh, failed. Uh, but that was sort of a springboard into the, the next part of my life, which was, um, you know, getting into the restaurants and bartending and a lot of different career choices along the way, but ultimately, um, you know, that's obviously where I landed, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's how I grew up. I mean, that's it. Run, run the streets. I mean, I was probably more part of, I'm a little older than you, I believe, but kind of that last generation where we didn't really have cell phones as kids. Yep. The street lights were the timer. Out in my bike, you know, wake up in the morning, out on the bike, wouldn't come back until after the street lights were on, you know, just that was the way it was. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, I'm thankful for that because I think that was, that was it, man. That was probably the best part. Right, the of greatest life. part of the childhood. That's it. Yeah, I remember riding my bike all over creation. Yeah, and that doesn't happen anymore. Right, for safety. Like even the last time you saw a kid on a bike, sometimes. Yeah, I know, right? They just don't. Maybe yeah. at the end of the driveway. Right, we, we were a gang of kids just riding mm -hmm. our bikes down Route Six and Seacon. Yeah, right. You know, with but, the, you're like, let's go to the convenience store and buy some candy. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> McDonald's and driving into Rumford and. Mm -hmm. You know, vandalizing things. Yeah. You know, I think the statute of limitations is up now. So I <laughs> talk about that. Um, so are you 100% Portuguese? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Both my parents were born there. And, um, you know, so, yeah. Have you ever been back? Yeah. When I was like four and then when I was like 14 or 15, my parents brought me back. But gotcha. I haven't been able to bring Heather and the kids. Is yeah. people say the Azores is the Caribbean of the Mediterranean. Is yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. I think the Azores and then yeah, Madeira Island, which is... Yeah south of the Azores, uh, and it's a big vacation spot for Europeans and, and things, and um, and that's what it is now. You know, it's gone through a lot of changes since, mm -hmm. God, my parents, my parents, the reason why my, all these families are even here is because how awful the government was there. Okay. And there was, like, a dictatorship, and it was, like, mm -hmm. really, really difficult, especially in the Azores, and, and that's why they emigrated here. Yeah. But if you go back now, I mean, if you go back now, you'd be like, I might want to stay here. Yeah. I mean, that's how it's, they, they're, they're doing really well. Yeah, and it's huge, um... Like vacation spot, right? That's kind of their number one yeah. infrastructure source of income. It's I'd imagine so. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to sit here saying everything about it, but ultimately, I know you know, travel has to be a huge part of it. And um, and I don't know what else anybody else does. I mean, some farming and stuff. And just, mm -hmm. but and like anything else, like here, there's, there's plumbers and there's everything yep. else. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, so they're they're they got a nice infrastructure going. Yeah, they're it's fine. definitely on my list. I've heard it's beautiful. Yeah, you'll love yeah, it. Yeah. All right. So you had a great childhood, brothers and sisters, classic East Providence boy. Tell me about maybe. Your youth, right? So now we're high school. You're a young man. Tell me a little bit about the background of how you met your wife. I think that's a really so, interesting story. Okay. So I met my wife when we were, I think I was 16. She was 14. We were working at Fantasyland at Seekonk, which no oh, longer exists. Oh, great right? spot. Broken yeah. heart that it's closed down now. All right. Not me. <laughs> place can burn down for all I care. I'm glad my kids don't ever get to drag me there. But um, so we met there and then soon after, you might know the story, but when we were children uh, in high school, we had some friends that died in an uh, accident mm -hmm. on the reservoir. And uh, so that's actually where we became really close friends. And so we had a nice little clique of friends. And from there on out, we were, you know, we just hit it off basically for always. And then 
you know, through what high school and then college and then even through some of those years, we were just always missing each other, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It was never a time where we actually ever dated. Yeah. It was never a time where we actually, like nothing. It was just sort of like we were just two souls that were kind of on these independent jersey, journeys but together. And then yeah. ultimately as time went on and we grew up, we were able to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And through that, you know, she had two, ch- two children along the way. And uh, when I had my opportunity, I took it. You swooped and in. Swooped in and we uh, made it work. So now I've got two beautiful stepdaughters since they were, what, six and two, six and three or seven and three, something like that. And um, the rest is history. Yeah. They're amazing. I saw her, I told you I saw her at the restaurant the other day. And yeah. she was so excited. Tell me about the last week and month you've had. You've had a busy family time. Yeah, so, all right, five kids. Um, one that just graduated from Temple in Philadelphia. So we had to go to Temple. Congratulations, by the Thank way. you very much. Very, yeah, very proud. proud. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, our next daughter graduated from high school. And uh, she's going to Ohio State. Repping the hat. Repping right? the hat, yeah. And so, you know, it was a whirlwind of going to old Columbus to visit the school, coming back, play, you know, getting to Philadelphia for that uh, graduation. And then we've got to go back to Columbus in July for an orientation, back to Columbus again in August to move her in. Uh, and then our youngest daughter, who's four, or excuse me, five, just graduated from pre-K. Mm-hmm. So we've got three graduates in the house. And then mm-hmm. obviously the two boys. Um and so that's it. And then obviously we've got the, not all well, you know, but um, it's rather than p- throw a massive graduation party, which ultimately would have been a wedding. Oh, yeah, pretty because much. Because the two of them together. Right. So you we, would have had 150 people and it would have cost you just a crazy amount of money. Right. So we decided, we offered the girls a vacation trip instead, which they took. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were going to Cancun for five days together, the four of us, which the four of us haven't been together like that since yeah. Max was born and he's uh, going on 13. I think it's such a great idea. Now, did you let them pick? Did you guys like, hey, we have four spots. How did you guys decide on where you're going to go for your trip? Um, well, for them, it was more about you know, they wanted the all-inclusive experience. Yeah. Kylie had already done it. Emma hadn't yet. She had just, just turned 18. Okay. So she wanted to see that. And mm-hmm. it was more about that. So we just looked in the Caribbean. We looked at Mexico. And, mm-hmm. you know, we've got five kids. And we can't just, you know, when we did our honeymoon, we went to St. Lucia. Mm-hmm. I mean, 10 days and all that. That was yeah. that was a different time. Now we've mm-hmm. got more overhead, let's say. And yeah. so we had to um, we just look at our options. And Cancun was the best, mm-hmm. the best bet. Gotcha. You're going to let Emma drink? It's not about letting Emma drink. I mean, so <laughs> the way uh, the way we parent them is never to say that you can't do anything, mm-hmm. right? It's that what are you going to do so that we can guide you yep. through that process? Mm-hmm. Now, if we're talking about illicit drug use and different things, it's certainly we've got boundaries in the house, yeah, right? Yeah. But ultimately, it's never really about saying no. It's it's sort of like here's the boundaries that you're allowed to be in and. Mm-hmm. And make sure she understands the consequences of if and, and how, what happens. And how she has to, she has to take ownership over those yeah, things, right? Like, you know, you, you can maybe drink, but you might not wake up and feel good, and you might ruin a whole entire day of our awesome vacation. Yeah. Right? Right. Well, yeah. it's even like, you know, I mean, obviously people know her, so it's like I don't want to spoil her secrets, but like, you know, she whatever she's doing recreationally, it's it's also like, okay, well, here's the, here's what you can do, here's what you can't do. Mm-hmm. You're right. You can't be driving around, right? You guys got to be safe. Yeah. I need to know what's going on so that, I can keep my phone on at night, and mm-hmm. mom knows what's going on. But yeah. do we worry? Sure. But at the same time, it's like, whether she tells you, she doesn't tell you. It's going to happen. No it's going to happen. Right? So the fact that we've built a relationship to the yeah. point where at least there's some honesty that goes back and forth, mm-hmm. then it's all you really can ask for. Is Trust, right? So my Connor's four. I just had, obviously, a new baby. Mm-hmm. Congratulations um, to you. Yeah. Thank you. I think of when my <laughs> children are going to be the age of your children. I'm, I think my only goal as a dad is to build up enough trust that he can trust to tell me anything he wants. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, I don't know what my reaction will be. Hopefully nothing well. too crazy. But I think my goal as a father for a son especially is going to be, hey, Dad, I wanted to let you know this, this, and this. And then we can talk about, okay, well, you know, maybe why did you do that? What were you thinking? There might be some consequences to it. Were well, there no consequences and you had the best time of your life? Let's talk, right? That's really, I think, all I... Could ever ask for that relationship right and i think that you know your reaction governs whether or not it happens again oh yeah you know you can come down on them and, and you know but what did you gain mm-hmm. and what did they gain yeah by that right and i i was um it's interesting too i was reading something the other day about children of people who have means 
mm-hmm. you know, and why, generally speaking, children of first generation Americans generally do better because they have necessity driving them, mm-hmm. right? And so when we think about our kids, so specifically Kylie and Emma had necessity because we were young. I was obviously very young when she had children. I was young and didn't know what the hell I was doing. Mm-hmm. I was just coming as a stepdad, you know, trying to figure this thing out. And so they were driven by necessity in some ways because, they, you know, we didn't have a lot. So mm-hmm. they were always sort of having to drive, drive, drive to take care of themselves. And that's that carried them into this young adulthood. And Kylie's 22 now. And so she's living in Philadelphia all by herself. And mm-hmm. she doesn't really need us other than for some emotional support and some advice here and there. She's doing her own thing, right? Yep. So, I, But I think about this younger crew now, your kids, mm-hmm. uh, the younger ch- children in our houses, mm-hmm. we have to contrive situations for them to be able to thrive on their own and figure it out on their own because if, if they don't meet that adversity early enough, then they're not going to be ready for it when it comes up. And oh, so yeah. as parents, it's like you got to be working at 15, 16 years mm-hmm. old. You have to be out there doing stuff because that's basically what the world's going to be like. Royal Flush might still be around, but it doesn't mean that it's going to line your pockets. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. It's just you got to go figure it out. Absolutely. I agree a thousand percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So you met the woman of your dreams. Sure did. You married her. She is pretty amazing. She's a super mom. Yeah. Everybody, anybody who knows Heather knows she's a super mom. Yeah, this feels like a commercial for you. This is going to turn yeah. into a commercial for her. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then so it sounds like, uh, tell me about how, where your professional career started. So you've been working in restaurants for a long time. Yeah. So I started at Cello's back in the day. I was about 19 maybe when I started there, serving and mm-hmm. bartending and um and then from there, it took me, you know, different places, as you would imagine, over the years. Uh, and, it carried, and, it, and it did a lot for me, you know, because, it, you know, bartending and restaurant work, um, especially when you're sort of unskilled, generally speaking, and uneducated. It's like I didn't have anything. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. And I was yep. good at it and um, had the capacity for it. And so it carried me all the way through probably 20, when I got married or so, I was 28 when I got married, something mm-hmm. like that. I know. And then it's like, all right, so still doing it. And then. At one point, I had like four different jobs at the same time, and I was just working all the time, you know. And then I settled down, did more corporate thing, right? Worked at Amica. Mm -hmm. That was fine. You know, great company, but uh, it just didn't scratch the itch, you know. And I I couldn't really sit there and do that, Mm -hmm. right? You strike me something similar. You can't just, can't just be sitting here. Yep, absolutely. And so um, we, I met. The gentleman I work for, he uh, we met socially. Our boys are both have both have special needs, and so we just kind of met um, that way. Mm-hmm. And um, it's sort of a relationship that sort of blossomed through that relationship, and then getting to know each other. He's got places, so I started doing a little work. It was really just one day a week, and it sort of just grew into, yeah, this is how, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, the man that's where the management side yeah. came in, which I had never done, and and so that's where I started it, and now it's been. Eight years. Yeah, you've been doing that for a long time. Yeah, eight mm-hmm. years now, which you know is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you, I think you manage what two back kind of two places he has. Right, tell me the full scope of the the restaurants that you're. Yeah, so now. there's three different places that I, I have varying degrees of um, of um, responsibility for. You know, and so one is like coffee shop that just you know more just back end work. I really just support. Um, the woman who runs that that place and mm-hmm. she's wonderful and it, you know she, I, again I'm just helping her out and, and I do a couple of things for the business and then the other two full more full service restaurants where I, I'm involved more day to day managing all the staff back a house front a house mm-hmm. finances you know work on the creative side with food and drink and um, and again but it's really busy right so you've got two places that are just really cranking which is really good and you know a lot of times I get you know that thing it's like oh. Ryan, this place is amazing. You're doing such a great job. Like just like from people I know, but it's yep. you know my response to that mostly is well, obviously thank you. We got to be obviously you know gracious, but it's really about putting the right people in place to do what they do. Mm-hmm. And I so I think that's my greatest ability through what I've learned is a you can't do it all by myself, and I'm not going to take the credit. And if I didn't have these people who do the cooking and the prepping and the cleaning and the bartending and the serving yeah. and all that stuff. It'd be nothing, mm-hmm. you know, and then using their input. So when they have understanding what people's strengths are, yes, putting them in ability in, in, a, in the position to use those strengths, mm-hmm. trying to build people around them to complement those strengths mm-hmm. or their weaknesses, whatever it might be, and sort of getting out of the way. And that's mm-hmm. part of it. It's I try not to get in the way of people, even if I don't necessarily agree with things that are being done or how they're being done. I have to allow it 
to happen because they can't do it the way I might necessarily yep. be thinking about. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and I think, you know, ownership's been great in terms of um, their understanding of that as well. I think there was a time there was a little bit of a, you know, a, a, um, what you, a cross section or a, um, I don't know what the word is I'm thinking about, but where it was difficult because, you know, things were always done a certain way, but in comes this guy who has no idea what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And when I started, I didn't. But th- then eventually it was, this is the only way I know how to do this is to allow people to be yeah. themselves mm-hmm. and, to, and to create the boundaries, just like raising kids like we yeah. talked about. It's really about creating boundaries and allowing people to work within them. Mm-hmm. And if they step out, then, then that's where you step in. But ultimately you kind of just get allow them to do the things that they do and that's where the businesses thrive. Yeah. It's about the people. Mm-hmm. What are some of your favorite things about, I think the, that business is fascinating to me, right? It's um, from an outsider, it's a little different of a lifestyle because the hours are a little unique. But what are some of your favorite things about that business that maybe you've learned the most personally and professionally and some of the things that you've really, really struggled with? Kind of go both ends of those. All right. Well, so I think that I never realized how important the creative element was to what I do on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. You know? Because I've come in front of bartending. I was just bartending. I wasn't really thinking about what I was doing, but I was doing that. Taking orders, smiling. Right. Delivering what they ask Del- Or even like, you know, kind of winging it for people and mm-hmm. just being creative and people responding to that. And then you kind of get that instant gratification mm-hmm. of, of that, right? And so I never really paid much attention to it until I go to the corporate world where really that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. There is no, there is just, you're just there. You're just <laughs> existing, right? And yep. so, and then I got it back out and back into the restaurants. And then once I really got comfortable um, trusting my instinct when it came to those things and, and then seeing the masses sort of re- respond to them, mm-hmm. whether it be cocktails or food ideas and things like that. And so I think that's sort of been, that's really the the part that keeps you going mm-hmm. is that part, yeah. right? And then there's the business side, which is atrocious, <laughs> right? It just is. I mean, that's just the nature of it. Well, like, there's, a, there's a big stereotype about the, you know, you can look up any statistics, you know, restaurant opens, fails in what, three years is right. the average. I know margins are a big part of that with food costs. Yeah, so tell me, tell me you know, some of the challenges on that back end. Of well, the I mean, all right, so we'll talk about just, obviously that's the history of it. And mm-hmm. then you take like COVID and you take like, you know, the cost of goods mm-hmm. into consideration and everything is just razor thin. Mm-hmm. You know, razor, razor thin. And so you have to be able to think on your feet and adjust and pivot. And, and that's consistently. That's like every week, every month, you're just constantly looking for every angle you can find to mm-hmm. make, th- make things work and make costs work, whether it be labor or... Again, what you're selling, right? And so sometimes I think you've got to remove your ego from what it is you're doing. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily Which can be about, really tough sometimes, right? Well, right. And you, but you have to be aware that you have one. Yeah. And I think yeah, people just walk around and sort of just, this is the way it is, right? And I, they don't really think big picture. And I think when you look at when you look at a restaurant's menu and you look at, sometimes if I go on a Friday night somewhere, which is rare, but if I go on a Friday night somewhere and it's like 7 o'clock and I sit down and I'm like, this place isn't really that busy. And you're like, why? So you sit down, you look at the menu. And so I hate to be that guy, but I can look at a menu and I am start and I start to look. And I'm like, oh, man, this isn't going to be mm-hmm. very good. And, you know, people aren't here and all that kind of stuff. And I think that um, you just have to pay attention to what people want. Yeah. Right? So it's not about what I want to cook or I want to make at the bar. It's about mm-hmm. what are people they, – they tell me. Yeah. We, they tell us what we what we're making, right? So we try stuff and they respond, all right. So we push harder in that direction, and if mm-hmm. it fizzles out, then we come back. So you're just constantly finding yep. those little areas where you're allowed to be in. And every restaurant's different. So mm-hmm. because one thing works at one restaurant does not mean even if it's three miles away that it's going to work there. It was crazy, isn't that? That's a very strange phenomenon to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think like if you run a hot dog, okay, in one location. Mm-hmm. It does remarkably well. And you move it to the other one, nothing. Crickets. You know, because it's just the way it is. I mean, there's different people in different towns. The vibes are different. The price points can be different. It's just there's just so many. But you have to be able to pay attention to it. You have to have your finger on the pulse. You can't just assume things are going to work. That Mm -hmm. goes for music. Yes. Lighting. Atmosphere is a big part of Atmosphere. All of it. So if we try to replicate that, just because we know it works here, Mm -hmm. we can try but you still have to pay attention to how people are reacting to that mm. and then adjust. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So Now, does that excite you? Does that frustrate you at times, the perpetual reacting and, and maneuvering? Or are you really excited that, hey, yeah. I'm, I'm able to be so fluid with these things, I can have 
a crazy success in one area, but I could fail equally as quick in another area on a hot dog or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. I think that's part of what drives me. And I mm-hmm. think that's part of um, why I keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Right. And don't get me wrong. It drives me crazy. Yeah. Like quite literally insane at times. Mm-hmm. But the flip side to that is uh, death by boredom. And I can't go out like that either. So it's Manusha, like. sure, right? Yeah. I just can't do it. So. I'm the sort of my worst enemy when it comes to this stuff sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. and I, even though I'm as busy as I am, it's still sort of like always thinking, always thinking about other industry under, you know, other opportunities. It's just one of those things that I just don't shut off. Yeah. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, I need it. What's your vision for these restaurants in the future? Is it, um, okay, okay, let me rephrase that. How do you define success in these restaurants? Um, all right. Well, there's, I guess a couple ways to answer that. I mean, one is that the doors are still open. Mm-hmm. As simple as it is, right? That's that is as direct fee, direct feedback as you can get. Is one of the best successes of a restaurant to say, "Hey, we've been open for seventeen years." Yeah, longevity, you know. And I think sometimes that's a good thing, and and sometimes it's a bad thing because just because you can get by in your name mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you should. Yep. Right? Because you've probably been places, which I obviously am not going to name, but you've probably been places that have been open for a really long time, and mm-hmm. you go and you're like, "Why is this place?" Why do I keep coming back here? Well, right. So this, why the, am I coming well, back? Here's a, here, that's an interesting thing. So that's mm-hmm. actually in the category of places, which I'll go over. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. So this place is that. Why does this place still exist? Yeah. Right. It's just they're just getting by in their name, and it just seems like everything's lazy. Like you know, but it's like, oh, but it's this place, so mm-hmm. everyone just keeps going. Right. Yeah. And they have places that have been around a long time, but they're just innovative, and they just keep pushing the envelope, and they know what works. They have their staples that they can co- always rely on, and they can still mm-hmm. drive themselves forward with new things. That's the best place to be in because. You know it works. People love the stuff that you do really well, and you're still trying to make it good and keep yep. people interesting. And then there's that other place, which is um, I, don't, I can't. I want to name any places, but like places that exist and they've been around for a long time. But why do we keep coming here? Mm-hmm. And I, I accompany it to why it's like that friend from high school that you have. And you go, but why are we even still friends? Yeah. Other than the fact that we went to high school together. Yep. Yeah, we have nothing in common. Right. We really don't have any interests anymore. We have two. Completely different outlooks on almost everything. Right, Why you don't still... bring up much value to my life yeah. anymore. Yep. But you know what? I love you, and uh, you know we're been friends. So that's yep. that's basically what that restaurant is. Yep. You know, there's a lot of restaurants that exist like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's nostalgia, and that's another powerful, yes. um, another powerful thing that you try to tap into when it comes to food and drink. Mm-hmm. And I think that's under um, underutilized. For me, food and drink is super emotional. Yeah. And it creates memories. Mm-hmm. Um. I was reading or thinking about something the other day, and they said that you can have a bottle of wine at a restaurant, you know, whatever, Smith's bottle of wine. It doesn't matter how much it is. And if you have it at a certain time with a certain group of people, that bottle of wine can create an emotion and could be the best bottle of wine you've ever had in your life. Mm -hmm. You can buy that bottle of wine on a Tuesday night, again, no matter how much money it is, how exclusive it is, and have it at home by yourself, and that bottle can taste like crap. Because what made it taste so amazing was probably good, but was the people, the feeling, the emotion, and the atmosphere. I think that's a really amazing thing about restaurants is the emotion that it can create. And a lot of people are there to celebrate things. They're there to escape day-to-day life. They're there to bond or spend time with somebody that there's important with them, right? These are things that are like this weird psychological thing to me about the restaurant business and what it can create and then what keeps people coming back, right? It's the emotion of... I went there with my wife. We hadn't been out for three months. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. We want to go back. Yep. That's really, really cool. Not many. I don't know many industries ever can create that emotional aspect or like tie to something. Right. And I think that uh, restaurants have the ability. We talked about uh, music. We talked about uh, vibe, decor, you know, the way the food looks. It's like it really should be when you go out to a restaurant, a salt on all of your senses. Mm-hmm. You don't really think of it that way, but that's really what's happening to you. If you go to a place that's doing it right, you may not necessarily realize it's happening to you. If you really pay attention to what you're seeing, what you're hearing, mm-hmm. what you're smelling, how the food looks when it gets to your table, and then all the other pieces, the company that you bring with you. Yeah. Right? And, and that's to your point. And I think like the other part of that emotion is um, you. everybody has a thing or things that they ate when they were kids or that their grandmother made for them mm-hmm. or their mom made for them or their uncle or whoever. They just have it just... You taste it and you see it, you smell it, and it automatically clicks and you, you remember that thing. And so you can do that with food. Mm-hmm. You can absolutely recreate those experiences for people in different ways. You know, 
taking meatloaf as an example, mm-hmm. right? Well, um, every kid had meatloaf growing up. Right. And, and it's, whether you hated it or loved it, either way, it it's probably would garner an emotion one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Right? And so when you do one and you do it really well, like really well, and just, it just, and then you, you're at a restaurant and you don't expect it to be that good mm-hmm. and you eat it and you're like, what the fuck? Why am I enjoying this so much? Like, is it really good? Yes. Yeah. But, but it's, there's another reason that maybe not everybody can even understand why, but there's a, there's a, always these things that just, they bring you back somewhere. Yeah. I think the best compliment for those types of things is like, right, is, is this, ready? This is better than my mom ever made. <laughs> yeah. If you could get somebody to say that, you're like, yeah. we did it right. Yeah. 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 That's right. the other advantage of cooking at restaurants though. Like I cook at home a lot, you know. But you don't cook at home like a cook in a restaurant. No, it's totally. And I have. I went. I've gone through spurts of time where I was cooking meals at home for like Heather and I, and I was just like getting after it, right? Mm-hmm. Just cooking my ass off, and it was a lot of fun. Like I loved doing it. Mm-hmm. But there's a reason why you, generally speaking, don't go to restaurants every day or every week because like the way you cook in a restaurant. I mean, it's so obnoxious. Just the amount of like things that go in your food, like just oh, yeah. fat and all the things that make it just be so amazing when you're out to eat. Yeah. So I was doing that at home. Mm-hmm. And I was after a while. We were. I was like, I can't do this because like I can't eat this much butter. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I saw a stat there that you know an average dish has a minimum of half a stick of butter in it, no matter what you're cooking. Yeah, something like that. Because One way flavor. or the other, it's in there. Yeah, yeah. You mm-hmm. need that fat. You need the salt. You need mm-hmm. all those pieces to get in there. And yep. um, so if you're into food, obviously enough, right? You pay attention to it. So there's a documentary on um, Netflix. It's called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. I think I've seen. I've, I went like five years ago. I did a heavy food. Uh, immersion on Netflix, which is cra- it's a rabbit hole of like mm-hmm. craziness, and you end up getting scared of what you're eating. Yeah. Uh, but so refresh my memory. Tell me what that's like. So she, uh, forgive me. I think she is. She's a chef, and if, I don't know if she's from Italy or if she's from the Middle East. I can't. Re- or she might even be um, Israeli. I'm not exactly sure. But she basically just it's four episodes. One's on salt. One's on fat, acid, and heat. And mm-hmm. she just talks about each component, and she goes to. You know, Italy, and she tries the Parmesan, and she tries the oils, and, mm-hmm. and she just talks about all those components and how important they are in terms of build, building balance when you're cooking. And mm-hmm. um, it's just a, again, for if you like, if you're into food, it's one of those. If you like cooking, it just it helps you understand what you're actually doing and yeah. why things taste good. Yep. It's the other thing you don't really realize why these dishes at restaurants when they're done really well, why you react to them the way you do is because yeah. they're just they're hitting. A little bit of all these categories, and then you go home and you try to do it, but it's like if you don't get mm-hmm. because you don't you're looking at a stick of butter, you're like, well, I'm not putting all that <laughs> yep. into this, but you are if that's kind of what the reaction you, you want, want to create. be. That's yeah. that's how you get that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think like a lot of people who are home cooks, I'm sure know that, but the people who who are interested in cooking maybe can't figure can't get how to how why that's that's mm-hmm. one of the things to watch. I mean, it's just eye opening. Yeah. My, um, you have not, have you had the chance to go to Italy yet? No. Okay. no. That was my favorite food uh, trip of all time. So I've always been into food, love cooking. And when I went there, I actually, I didn't like wine until we went to Italy. Mm-hmm. Anytime I drank wine, it didn't really make me feel that great. I kind of ended up with a headache. But, um, you know, the word organic or natural gets thrown around a lot. Literally, when you go there, <clears throat> the culture and the people and the food and what they eat, it's so different from here, and you would look at the carbs and the oils at the, and you would think, you know, it'd be the American overweight culture, and it's not because literally everything is grown and created right there, mm-hmm. and as simple as the grapes and the wine. We went to a winery, met a guy who was fifty five years old, and this man was so happy. He literally come come see my grapes. He said, "You see this grapevine? This is two hundred years old. My great grandfather planted this," and he was taking the grapes from that vine and going to his distillery and making the wine and serving it to you right there and that was the most amazing wine i've ever had in my life and i never liked wine ever before right. and so it's like those things that food creates and those like that he was literally he was almost crying yeah showing you a, a plant this is these are my grapevines and uh and no other culture when i've been able to travel was like the food and the beverage culture in yeah. Italy. It's awesome. I yeah, I think... I, 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 well, I'd like to think maybe it's on your list. I hope you get to go because you will feel the same thing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, it's on my list. I think, you know, one of the things I would want to do if I was in Italy is to avoid all the things that people want to go to Italy for. Generally speaking, I'm not interested in, in you know, I don't know, Venice or wherever. You know, I don't know. I know I know the places, but I'd just rather... I'd rather go in, like, on a guided place of, like, mm-hmm. restaurants and, and vineyards and... Yep. I'd rather go eat in someone's grandmother's house oh, yeah. 
then, mm-hmm. you know, do all those other things. I would really want to get a taste of it that way, yeah, to your point. You know, I think, like, that's what the Azores, that's the opportunity yeah, with the Azores yeah, as well. Right. You know, when I was, again, 14, 15, I didn't eat the food my parents were cooking that I grew up with, you know? Mm-hmm. I was trying to just be an American kid and eat oh, yeah. regular food, Go right? Fast food Like salted day. cod and blood sausages <laughs> and all that stuff. Like, I was all set, right? But when mm-hmm. I went there and my aunt made food there, mm-hmm. and she, in her house, uh, she had, and they're very, they do very well for themselves there, and she had, in the house, they had the, the, one of those fire ovens, you know, mm-hmm. like wood-burning ovens, and they cooked, she cooked a salted cod dish, and she was cooking marsala, which is the, the blood sausage, and I ate it up, and my parents couldn't believe it, and ever since then, though, it's like, you know, it changed my view on what that food is. And I yeah. think like, um, it speaks to kind of what you said earlier, that emotional piece. We talk about the guy growing his grapes and the pride that people have. And that's what food is. I mean, if I cook, you know, if I have people at my house and I'm cooking, I just don't make, and it isn't against anybody, what anybody else does. It's just, this is what food is for me. It's personal. Mm-hmm. So if I'm inviting you in and we're going to do this, I don't just make like pasta salad and hot dogs and stuff like that. We can do that. That's fine yeah. too. You know, it depends on how tired I am, maybe. But like mm-hmm. if I decide like I'm going to do this, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to get after it and mm-hmm. and do it because I have pride in it and it's really important to me. That's mm-hmm. kind of how we view it. Yeah, I agree a thousand percent. Let's transition away from food a little bit. Let's talk about life as an adult and a parent, right? Mm-hmm. And so tell me. What are you interested in right now? What are you doing for a hobby? What kind of gets your blood pumping? What what scares you to death? What are you worried about? Like, just tell me you know, what's going on in your life and what you're right really now. All in. right, so let's talk about. All right, well, this might go in a lot of different directions. That's so you take it any direction you yeah, want. Well, I mean, like, so for me personally, the last few months has been um, sort of a. It, uh, how do I do this? How do I? Constantly, you have. To, I feel like you have to con- just like restaurants, right? You have to constantly be working on yourself, right? Mm-hmm. You can't just coast and if you coast for a long time you get away with it and there's nothing wrong with that right but after a while you, you wake up and you realize you how did i get here mm-hmm. because you just were just waking up taking care of business and you know you just that cycle yeah. goes on and on and on and so every once in a while you got to wake up and sort of figure take stock of what's going on in your life and so for me like um i've been exercising a lot more i've been i you know, cut back drinking big time mm-hmm. right Still a tequila guy, but it was, you know, I was hitting it pretty good for a while there, right? <laughs> and so I, um, now I'm down to like maybe a drink or two a week, you know, which is nice. I wake up every day around 4, 4.30 in the morning, okay. it's a three-mile walk, and then come home, get the kids ready for school with Heather, and then we're back at the gym at 9, you know, and then we, you know, then we go about our day, got to work and do all those, you know, the kids' activities and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, but for me, personally, I've been on a journey of just sort of like trying to figure out just what you asked. It's like, what am, what is it that I'm trying to do yeah you know what i mean because like the work is is always going to be there and you know and i think like i've i'm at this point now that you know retirement uh it's not really something that's that interests me Mm -hmm. and i think when i was doing work that i didn't really want to do like you know you being in my like 30 years old and thinking about i'm at i'm at working at amica and all Mm -hmm. this stuff and remember thinking about all right i gotta do this for another 30 years or something and i was like Right. And mm-hmm. so now it's like, I don't even think about it yeah. to the point where I don't even have plans for it. Like, I don't think about not doing anything. It's like Jim. Mm-hmm. Like, Jim doesn't want to stop. Yeah. And I understand that. Mm-hmm. I understand that. I think that I'll always be doing something. Yeah. See, that's a very, that's a different perspective. It's a great conversation because I'm actually quite the opposite. Yeah. So since I joined Royal Flusher, this, this job has gotten my blood pumping more than anything I've ever done in my life. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy. Who would have thought? Who would have exactly? Yeah, who would have mm-hmm. ever thought this? It pretty much consumes in the best way possible. Yep. What um, trying to come up with a plan and a vision for growth and what we're doing is so exciting. But so I just turned thirty nine yesterday. Mm-hmm. I have a goal to retire by fifty. Okay. And um, I love work. I love this, but I have so many other things in my mind that I want to do. Well, what does that mean? So, what does retiring yeah. at fifty so, mean to you? Yes, I'm honestly for me. Um, at that point, I would love to say that this company is so wildly successful that we can either sell it or that we're branching off in a franchise or a multi-location place. And we have somebody here in place, whether that's a formal CEO or branch managers or whatever, that are running that company. You know, I've, I'll always be involved somewhat, but by no means, you know, if I'm if I'm 51 and I'm coming in and doing somewhat similar what I'm, I'm going to be mad at myself mm-hmm. because Fair I enough. think I, like yeah, I, appreciate I that. think we've got enough going here, and that I can implement enough things for success that I can separate myself. And there's so many things I want to do personally. I have so many hobbies that I don't get to do now. So many things that I want to do with Jade. We have a 
crazy passion for traveling. Mm -hmm. Um, at that point, my children will still be pretty young, but they'll be in their high school days. And I have a vision of, you know, dropping the kids off to school and me and Jade going about gallivanting for the day and just doing anything we'd want and then picking them up and spending time with them Mm -hmm. and then traveling all summer. Yeah. And I think that our visions probably align more. I think we're just defining it differently. And I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, if I, to your point, if I'm still doing what I'm doing in 10 years, yeah, I'll be pissed Mm -hmm. to the point where I talk about it often enough. I mean, I think our window, my window for this is probably three to five, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's just draining. And, you know, for a while it was a means to doing what I had to do to take care of my family. Right. Right. And then it's grown into much more than I would have ever thought it would. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm grateful for it and all that. And, um, and I, but I know that when I have this next batch of kids and I just, that's how I think about it. I think about it in these two groups, not because it's like stepchildren and children, but there's just the age gap. Yes, yeah, the age. And it's like, all right, these two, one's graduated, one's going into college. And so while I'll still always be there for them, they're sort of Mm-hmm. kind of doing their thing, right? Yep. And so, but they were very busy growing up, you know, their dance classes and their sports, and I think to the cost of the younger kids, right? Because these guys are always getting dragged along. And so I think their lives are actually, you know, enriched by their older sisters yep. and stuff, right? So there's a balance there. And I think now that, all right, now I've got, I got to do this again. Now we've got, now what I have, I'm armed with is wisdom. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you got a second chance. Yeah. And so not, not everybody gets that, right? Mm-hmm. And so not everybody can look at their, you know, you're raising, sometimes you're raising, kids who are between two and six and it's like there's this whirlwind and then it's like are you done you're like i don't know what's going on mm-hmm. right and so we've have the luck of having these older girls and they're sort of done ish right and then i now i have that i'm armed with that wisdom and knowing how quickly it goes by and all that now we've got this group and so but then you bring in the restaurants and it's, and it's too much to really do now mm-hmm. thankfully again completely grateful i've been able to build it to the point where i can do still do the things i want to do How's yeah. that? Right. And so, I, again, it's, it's how much work as it is and as time consuming as it is, as stressful as it is, I still have the opportunity to walk away when I need to walk away. Mm-hmm. Right. If I'm if I'm doing my job correctly, then everybody, everything's in yep. place and mm-hmm. it's going and I just have to manage it to make sure that it's going in the right direction and all that. So I'm lucky when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, and so, like, you know, I'm able to bring my daughter to Columbus and then mm-hmm. go to Philadelphia and then take the other ones on vacation and then go back to Columbus uh, in August and send Heather and, and Emma back to Columbus in July. And I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky that I've been able to build this with the team that I have and the mentorship that I have. Um, but I, you know, three to five years, mm-hmm. that's, that's it. Because that's when, you know, Wes will be 10 to 12, Josie will be 8 to 10, Max is going to be, Max is 12 already, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, obviously he's got special needs, so he'll be in high school until he's 22, and so we've got some time there with him, Mm -hmm. right, and so, but I've got that window of time to really reset things so that I can be that version of the dad that you want to be, Yeah. Um, hopefully things go well with the restaurants up until that point where I've been able to build an opportunity where I can choose more about how I'm spending my time, to Mm -hmm. your point, Yep. so, but the way I guess we define retirement is different. And yeah. so I'm, it's not that I'm not going to do stuff or not going to work because that's not the plan. Mm-hmm. It's just like I'm going to build it hopefully around the things that I want to do. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Right? Because yeah. my brain will die. <laughs> it's just <laughs> not enough space. So, like, I was diagnosed with uh, ADHD uh, a few months ago as an adult, which I've never. Oh, really? Yeah. I was never diagnosed as a child or, or high school or anything like that. Never really even seeked it out. Didn't really even think it was a problem. Well, t- so tell me how you, this, what caused you to look into it? Uh, so I obviously I'm very busy and, and, you know, I balance a lot of different things between home, um, and obviously the businesses and all those mm-hmm. things. Right. And so, you know, we used to, I used to joke a lot with just people like about ADHD because it, for a while it felt like I was like, um, you know, different, mm-hmm. right. I was able to handle a lot of stuff, compartmentalize and just be able to handle more things that you're not supposed to be able to handle. How's yep. that? Right. Mm-hmm. And so event, but eventually I kind of hit a wall. And then I hit the wall, and then I couldn't really get past it, and then everything started to become overwhelming. It was like basically just I was just overloaded with mm-hmm. with um, with things to do, and uh, and I couldn't concentrate on things that I needed to concentrate on. So like I was very macro mm-hmm. at everything, but when I had to slow down and kind of get into like micro situations to kind of figure them out, it was it was physically impossible for me to do it. To hmm. so, where it's like a lot of anxiety that built up, shame, all that kind of stuff that goes yep. along with just feeling like you're doing a bad job. And then one of my employees was. Um, diagnosed and she was talking to her about it. I was like, that's interesting. 
And so I did my own research on it and started to understand what it was. Yeah. And basically looking back on, um, you know, the way I was as a child, the way I was through high school and college, you know, and I think a lot of parts of ADHD is like the impulse control. Okay. Right. And we think about a little boy who can't just, he's like, they're just always, mm-hmm. you know, slamming their head against the wall or something. Right. Um, like, you know, high school, growing up in school, like, I'm blessed that I have like a baseline of intelligence, right? Not everybody has that, but I'm lucky that I, I did. And I was able to handle a lot of information. So I could be in school all the way through high school. I don't even remember doing an ounce of homework <laughs> ever, mm-hmm. right? I don't remember. I never studied, never had to. I could write a paper in a day. Mm-hmm. I just, just take care of business, right? And I did fine. And then I got to college. And then I learned that at college, that, that wasn't, wasn't good enough anymore. Yeah. You actually, but I didn't have the skills necessary to thrive there, mm-hmm. right? So it didn't work out for me. So looking, you know, going down throughout my whole life and, and decisions I make, even like short-term decisions, impulsive things, um, even like, you know, in your youth, uh, things that, you know, even drinking and like those decisions and promiscuity, all those things, I, I, I can sort of look at myself backwards now and understand sort of why things were the way they were, right? Mm. So I get, a, I get diagnosed and so I started taking the medicine that went along with it and it was sort of, it was just... I mean, I'm like speechless about really? sort of the understanding of like what it was I was dealing with mm-hmm. and how far I was able to get with how I was dealing with things. Yeah. And then sort of relearning like sort of how my brain works, mm-hmm. being able to calm my brain down when it needed to be calmed down, be able to concentrate on things that were mm-hmm. maybe unimportant and uninteresting to me. But that's sort of like what being an adult is, right? Yeah. Is like doing these things that, you know, you don't want to. And, um, through that, you know, it's and it's helped with again the impulse control, of looking at like the drinking, right? And so the drinking for me at, at one point it just became a vice to like slow it down. Mm-hmm. Like I could not slow my mind down. I was always going. I would sleep and wake up as if I slept, but my brain didn't never turned, never off. turned off at all. I'd wake up like I was exactly in the same state of mind as I was mm-hmm. at night. And so you know the and so with the with the medicine and then being able to like sort of just control my impulses, it's helped with food choices, mm-hmm. just m- not mindlessly putting things on my face. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, cause you don't even like it for me. I don't know. You've always been generally the same size you are now. Mm-hmm. Then, right. You don't seem like you fluctuate that much. Maybe yeah. you've got a good impulse control. You could decision making skills. You've, you've been on a trajectory in your life. Right. And I think for me, I'm lucky. I feel lucky that I've been able to get to where I am because I could have gone South in a lot of different things. If I had maybe more consequences for some of the, poor decisions I made, mm-hmm. it would have been different for me, right? Yeah. So I kind of was able to skate through all that to get to this point in my life, which is now going to help me be better parent, better husband, better to myself, you know what yeah. I mean? And a uh, better employee, better boss, all those things, right? So I can, I figure out how we got here, but ultimately that's... that's Are you excited about that? You must yeah. feel, almost feel like a different person, really, Yeah, right? Yeah, I do. And I understand myself more, mm-hmm. you know, so I look back and so a lot of times it's like, you know, you look back with sometimes with regret. Yeah. How's that right? Mm-hmm. Decisions you make and things like that. I used to carry that a lot. I carry that around, carry that around with me a lot, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't anymore. I just let it go because I just say, well, that was that was what I was dealing with. It, yeah. was, it is what it is. But now it's like I can look back on it, sort of forgive myself for some of those things, um, and so now it's sort of rebuilding things moving forward. For me, like I'm 41, and I've said this to Heather before. Like sometimes it's probably a dangerous way to think, but. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to live to like 150. Mm-hmm. Like, I just feel like if I keep my mind right, my body right, I mean, obviously I'm not going to, but I just don't feel like why, what, why am I going to slow down? Yeah. You know, and why? If, I don't, if you don't let yourself and you take care of yourself and you're engaged in the things that you're doing and you're raising your children and they're raised and you've got grandchildren and you can travel, go see them, still do some work. Do things that excite you. Live a full you. life, do things that excite yeah. you. Then that's it. I'll go as far as I can go. Let's wrap it up with this. Do you have any advice, anything that you'd like to pass along to anybody, whether it's uh, business growing up, your Portuguese heritage, raising kids, anything that, like, if you meet somebody on the street and say, hey, man, you know what? I did this. This was a really cool piece of advice I'd like to pass it along to you. Well, I think one of the best pieces of advice I got um, from, I'll give him a shout out. So uh, Michael Barry, which you may or may not know. Um, I don't know if I've met Mike before. No, so you, you may have in, in passing, but you just don't remember. But he, um, I was at a crossroads in my life at one point about you know making a decision to. It may have been. It may have even been the restaurants, like deciding to really full go. And mm-hmm. I know he's a guy who's reinvented himself a few times. Um, 
And he said, you know, sometimes in life you've got to take two steps back in order to mm-hmm. to move forward, yep. you know. And I think that's the piece of advice I think that um, that always rings in my ear about when you've got to make decisions about things and understanding that, you know, not everything's a step forward. And sometimes you have to, like, pivot sideways mm-hmm. back to, in order to build, which I was able to do. Yeah. And I think with that piece of advice sort of helped me. And I think that, you know, whether that be professional – or personal, you know, you've got to sometimes be able to step back, take inventory, mm-hmm. you know, and be honest with yourself. I think that um, if you if you allow yourself to be dishonest with yourself, then it's like what well, you're starting from. A bad uh, point. A bad point. Yeah. You know, and I'm constantly on a quest for self-improvement, you know, widening my, my thought process, trying to understand people better. I'm trying to understand myself better. Mm-hmm. It helps me manage them better be a husband, be a father, um, you know, and, and it's not because I have things figured out. Sometimes I try to offer advice and I think that what I've learned, another thing I've learned is beware of wisdom you didn't earn. Mm, that's a good way to put uh, it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that comes from, um, that comes from people who take like psychedelics, right? Which is another thing I've been really into. I haven't done on a large scale in terms of like actually going on one of those psychedelic trips, which is mm-hmm. another nice rabbit hole on Netflix, by the way. Okay. Um, there's one called Fantastic Fungi by Paul Stamets, um, who's it's incredible. So you should, I would highly recommend that. But one of the things that you, I, that that statement of beware of wisdom you didn't earn is like you know you can go on these transcendent sort of journeys through psychedelics that will really really change your life. I really believe that, and it, it does a lot for people both with addiction. There's a lot of medical use for it, but mm-hmm. even it just allows people to reset themselves. You know, and you can have bad trips and all that. So, but but ultimately. Just because you go through that change and you've gained wisdom through a journey like that doesn't mean you have the tools to deal with that wisdom, right? Mm-hmm. So you still have to sort of get out there and do things yourself, yep. right? And I think when I give advice to people, I used to give it sort of willy-nilly, like, because I want to help people. Yeah, I'm on a self-improving journey and I want to take as many people I can with me. That's sort of how I view my life is I want to talk to the young guys that work for me and really anybody right but at the same time i've come to the realization that that same statement goes towards raising children and giving advice to anybody is like you know i try to tell the older girls it's like i have the answers to the test like tom brady used to say Mm -hmm. i have the answers to the test and i want to give them to you right but at the same time i can give you the best piece of advice to a 25 year old guy but it does not matter Mm -hmm. unless he learns the lesson himself yeah he's got to figure it himself so i don't know there you go I think that's a good spot to wrap it up, Ry. Cool. Thanks. I appreciate it, man. I hope everybody enjoyed the conversation. We will definitely have you back. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, Ry.